I grew up in this tiny little village up in the Scottish Highlands, and when I say tiny, I mean tiny. Not counting the two farms with their big old farmer's houses, there were five homes, a farm shop, and a pub. That's it. At the edge of the village was a bus stop, and that was my portal to civilization for the first 17 years of my life. Life was the same for all the kids in the surrounding villages too. It wasn't just us that lived like that. We had nothing to do at home and only one notoriously unreliable bus service to get us out of our various little hamlets. So when I reached my mid-teens and owning a car became an option, the prospect of getting my hands on one seemed like my golden ticket to freedom. I could go anywhere, do anything, get out of my drab little village for days at a time and all I needed was a bit of petrol money. I worked my butt off, saving every penny I could, putting it all towards this little three-door hatchback I'd spotted in the local paper. Then on my 17th, my dad revealed he'd already put a deposit down on it, and all I had to do was pay off the rest out of my own money, and I owned the thing. I remember my mates being almost as happy as I was about the new car. After all, they were going to be reaping the benefits of my newfound mobility too. We all drove up to Inverness for the day, went to Domino's, and tried getting served in a few of the pubs there, but as good a laugh as that was, it was hardly the big city or anything, and it was only for a few hours drive there and back. We started eyeing up a bit more of a challenging destination, somewhere none of us had ever been, as far from home as my car could take us, so after some discussion, we decided on London. None of us had ever been to London before. And as much as Edinburgh was the center of our world, London seemed like the center of the universe. It was gearing up to be a real lads on tour kind of trip, so we decided to all save up for a few months, then we'd drive down in the summer to make the most of the daylight and the good weather. It took us quite a while, and the planning stage of such a big journey made it feel like we were going to star in our own Lord of the Rings spin-off. But when the time came to pack up the car and hit the road, we could barely contain our excitement. We thought it'd be the road trip that would define our young lives, something to bridge the gap from boyhood to adulthood, and in a way, that's exactly what it was. And even though we wouldn't actually make it to London, none of us would ever be the same again. We planned on completing the 10-hour drive in two legs, one five-hour drive down to Blackpool, where we'd sleep overnight in a hotel, and then the next day, we'd make the next five hours or so down to London. We picked out a travel lodge on the edge of town to get ourselves a few rooms and the drive down was easy enough, but when we got there, we realized that we made a very silly mistake. Instead of actually booking the rooms and paying in advance, we thought that we'd be able to just rock up at a leisure. So when the nice lady at the front desk apologized and told us that they were all booked up, we were less than pleased with ourselves. We drove around a bit more, hoping to find somewhere with a free room or two, but to our absolute horror, everywhere was booked up for the night, and in the end, we just had to accept that we had to just keep driving, which was well off the cards because I was completely exhausted, or try our best to get some sleep in the car after parking somewhere safe and discreet. And that's how we ended up in the car park of some service station, leaning the seats back and settling in for a few hours of terrible sleep before we got back on the road to London. I'm not sure how long later, but I woke up to one of my mates, Alistair, tapping me on the shoulder saying he needed to go to the toilet. Given that it was a three-door, that meant that I needed to get out of the car and pull the seat forward so Ali had room to get out. I'm absolutely banjaxed by this point, so I grumpily get out of the car so that Ali could go and relieve himself in some nearby bushes. The noise woke the other lads up who weren't best pleased to have their sleep disturbed. Then I sat on the edge of my driver's seat, feet on the concrete outside, watching Ali walking off into this dark corner of the car park. I remember rubbing my eyes, telling myself it would all be worth it once we were raising hell among the poor unsuspecting Sassanachs. But then seconds later, I hear the bushes rustling, and I looked up to see Ali bursting out of them, running full pelt back at the car. Before I can even say anything, Ollie is just jabbering, start the car, start the car, start the car, all while basically shoving me out of the way so he can clamber into the back seat again. This obviously had everyone in the car asking him what his problem was, but 
He's just ignoring them, focusing on telling me that we needed to get moving. Quite quickly, I worked out that whatever had him so freaked out had obviously been in the bushes he'd walked into to take a wee, and I remember turning back around to look at them before seeing the shape of a person suddenly walk into the orange lamplight. I could see it was a bloke. I could just tell from the look of him, but other than that, I couldn't make out much detail. What I could see, though, was that this bloke was power walking over to our car, and not in a way that suggested that they were going to be calm or polite about their little encounter with Ollie. God knows what had happened, but it obviously wasn't good. I know it sounds a bit selfish, but the first thing that went through my mind was, he's going to damage my car. But see it from my perspective. Allie was in the back seat by that point, so if the random bloke's got plans for violence, it's either me or my car that's going to get it. That had me twisting the key into the ignition like a madman. Then as soon as I got a decent rev going, I put my foot down and we zoomed out of the car park back onto the main road. Once we appear to be safe, the lot of us are basically screeching at Allie to tell us how he'd managed to piss someone off in the middle of nowhere and in the middle of the night. Allie was a bit of a joker back then, still is to be honest, and he had this way of rubbing people up the wrong way. He just couldn't help himself, almost like he kept all his smart comments bottled up. He exploded. It was always getting us in trouble back home, so naturally our first assumption was that he pulled a classic alley and gotten us chased away from our sleeping spot. He just about blew his top at the accusation, completely denied being rude to anyone, then told everyone to shut up so he could explain what had happened. When he said it, I actually thought that he was lying to us, and that it was a way of getting out of the doghouse with us so he wouldn't start the trip in everyone's bad books. But then, when we made him swear on his mum's life, he did, telling us again, Boys, I swear to God, I think I just witnessed a murder. It's about three in the morning at that point, on this quiet stretch of dual carriageway, somewhere between Manchester and Liverpool, and we're all listening as Ali starts telling us his story. He said he walked into the bushes, walked right out of sight of the car park for some privacy, and then just as he about to whip his bobby out, he heard something not too far away from him. Not wanting to start peeing until he knew he was alone, Ali said he creeps through the bushes a bit more, trying to work out what and where the sound was. He said it sounded like something was punching a pillow or something, like these muted strikes that lined up with someone making these soft grunting noises. Now, if your mind is building a slightly unsavory image of what that noise could be, you and Ali think alike, because he too thought that he was about to catch two people playing a wee game of hide the sausage. At least, that was his excuse for why he was so curious and why he went skulking through some bushes in the middle of the night. But then, instead of finding two wrongins engaged in a bit of hanky-panky, he sees what he can only describe as a bloke kneeling over another, looking like he was slamming his fist down onto the other one's chest. The bloke taking it is lying on the grass verge, not making a sound, and that's when Ali realizes that the bloke isn't just hitting the other one with his fist. He's got a knife in his hand. He's not punching him. He's stabbing him. When he realized what he was looking at, Ali said he must have made a noise or something, what I imagine to be either a gasp or a rustle of the bushes or something. The bloke hears it, turns toward Ali, and that was Ali's cue to come legging it back through the bushes and into the lights of the car park. Ali finishes his little horror story, and we're still in a state of disbelief. Only that time, it wasn't so much because we didn't believe him, it was because we didn't want to believe him. His tone of voice, the way he's telling us the story, everything about the way he was acting made me think that he was actually telling the truth. Ali was a brave lad, I suppose you had to be with a mouth like that. So to see him so piss your pants frightened wasn't something we thought he could fake. We're still trying to pick apart his story, poke holes in it, or get him to admit that he was exaggerating or something, but he wouldn't. He swore blind that that's what he'd seen, and that we needed to get to a police station or something. Then right as he says that about telling the Jakes, I look up into my rear view to see a pair of headlights coming up really, really fast on my rear bumper. I tune out of the conversation for a second, watching the headlights and expecting them to start passing me, but they didn't. 
and the next thing I know, the headlights are so close and so bright that they're lighting up the whole inside of my car. This then gets the attention of the lads, and as I'm panicking, wondering what the bloody hell this other driver is thinking, I just hear Ali say, Oh no, it's him. A split second after that, wham. The driver speeds up and smashes his front bumper into my rear. We all let out these shouts of terror as I kept my hands gripped on the steering wheel. I just about kept control of the car, but another hit like that, and I might not be able to stop from just careening off the road. It was like being stuck in this horrible Catch-22. We'd speed up and try to get away, and I'd definitely lose control of the car the next time the driver hit us, or slow down, try to pull over, and face the fury of whoever was trying to run us off the road. In the end, the driver decided for us, but the next time he hit us, he managed to focus the force onto one side of my bumper, not exactly like a pit maneuver if you know what one of those is, but it was basically the same effect. I completely lost control of the car, and even though I tried to keep us on the road, we ended up smashing into a metal barrier at the side of the road, and the car went down a small slope on the other side and flipped over a few times in the process. I just remember closing my eyes and thinking, this is how I'm going to die, and I gripped the steering wheel as hard as I possibly could while I waited for something to just switch my lights out. Then suddenly, the car was still. Everything hurt, but I was still awake and I was still alive. Somehow we'd been lucky enough to land wheels down and the first thing I did was turn off the engine because I could see smoke coming out from under the bonnet. We're all in agony, but I knew from the various groans and curses that everyone was relatively okay. But then I suddenly realized that I can smell petrol, and I knew that we were in serious trouble. Only the passenger side door was working and only one of the seats would come forward, and we did actually manage to get everyone out of the car. There were also no fires at all, but we didn't know that at the time, so even though we were in a considerable amount of pain, we did manage to get out. I feel like now would be an appropriate time to tell you all of this happened back before mobile phones were in everyday time. This meant that if we wanted to contact the police, we had to either find a roadside phone which could be used in case of emergencies, or we had to hope that another driver was passing so we could send them to get some help. Only two of us, me and Fraser, were good enough to walk anywhere, but that meant leaving Allie and our other mate Connor alone by the roadside. If the bloke who smashed us off the road came back and saw Allie there sitting all helpless at the side of the road, he and Connor would be in quite a bit of trouble. After all, if the bloke really was trying to get rid of any witnesses, he might not hesitate to hurt the both of them or even hang around and wait for us to come back. Luckily, that didn't happen though because our car came around the bend just as me and Fraser were heading off and the woman driving had one of those old style mobile phones that looked like a brick with an antenna on the end of it so she was able to get in touch with the Jakes for us and we just about begged her to hang around until they arrived, and although the van that drove us off the road didn't reappear, we were terrified that he was going to come back to finish the job he'd started. In the end, we all spent the rest of the night in a hospital in Greater Manchester, with two police officers hanging around to get all of our stories. Each of us had a collection of sprains and other injuries, but nothing that a few days' rest wouldn't see on the mend. We were incredibly lucky, and that goes without saying, and one doctor in particular reminded me of this, saying if we'd been going 10 or 15 miles over, or if the car had stayed on the road, we probably wouldn't have survived. That part really played out in my mind, because like I mentioned, I was actually trying to keep us on the road, thinking that that was our best option. I stand by it, because if we'd have crashed into a river or something, that would have been far worse. But if I had gone a bit faster to try and get away and then lost control, none of us would have walked away from that crash that night. I was able to call my mom and dad from the hospital and although they were horrified at the news that we'd crashed, they were just as relieved as we were to hear that we'd walked away with just a few sprains and bruises. Obviously, I was gutted about my car. Months and months of work had been almost a complete waste of time. But somehow... Given how serious the situation was, I didn't feel like I'd really lost anything. 
I still had my health, all of my mates were okay aside from serious whiplash, and I could still borrow my dad's car if I ever really needed it. Losing my car was crap, but in the grand scheme of things it didn't really matter. Only much later did we find out that the police had found evidence of a violent crime near the car park we'd been trying to sleep. They didn't find any dead body or anything, but there was enough blood to corroborate Allie's story about seeing a person getting stabbed. The van that had crashed into us was found about a week later, abandoned in some woodland on the other side of Manchester. There were bloodstains on the inside and the registration matched one that had been sitting in the same car park we'd tried to get some sleep in. All in all, we'd narrowly avoided permanently being silenced as witnesses to a murder, but beyond that, we didn't learn much else for quite a while. We had no idea if they ever caught the guy who chased us, why he killed the bloke Ali saw, nothing more than we were very, very lucky to get away alive. But then, my parents get a call from Fraser's parents because Fraser's aunt was working down in Leeds and had been following the story. The murder victim was the joint owner of some builder's firm in Blackpool, and he'd recently taken his partner to court over some kind of fraud thing. Not long after the bloke's body was found, i.e. the one we found, this sticky-fingered partner of his goes missing and becomes the prime suspect of his partner's murder. That was the fellow who chased us in his van, and Ali had actually stumbled across him, finishing off the partner he'd robbed. The worst thing, though, is that Ali had been mistaken about the murderer stabbing his partner in the chest, because the actual cause of death was strangulation. The bloke had brought a knife along because he wanted to make it as hard as possible for the police to identify his partner's body. He wasn't stabbing the bloke in the chest. It was just too dark for Ali to see the victim was being stabbed in the face. We didn't learn that little detail until much later on. Fraser's dad had told my dad, but my dad just didn't have the heart to tell me something that horrific. It took until we were all in our mid-twenties for it to make its way around to me and my friends, and when it did, let me tell you, chills. This all happened so long ago that me and my three old pals are mostly married with kids and stuff and living in other places, so we don't get to see each other as much as we'd like. But every so often, we're all back home at the same time and we'll go for a pint in one of the locals. Spirits are always high during these wee reunions, but at some point, the conversation inevitably turns towards the crash and how lucky we all are that we got to go home alive after it. When there's one bloke who never got to go home at all. Back in my early 20s, me and my bestie went through a phase of going on road trips every other weekend, and this one time, we planned on driving all the way to San Francisco, with a few stops in between. So first day, we're about four hours into the drive, and we're going along I-70 in Colorado, coming up on the state line. Around 8pm, we pull over at a gas station, and while I'm fueling up, I notice these other two girls pumping gas. They looked around the same age as us, like they could have been on a road trip just like we were, but just behind them at the other pump was this guy. He looked like he was in his late 30s or early 40s and the girls can't see him doing it, but he's just staring at these two girls with a blank expression on his face, eyes darting back and forth between them as they pumped their gas. It was really creepy, but after a while the guy went back to seeing to his car and I went inside of the gas station to grab some snacks as fuel for our night drive up to Salt Lake City. When I walk back out of the gas station, the girls are just leaving in their car, and when I take a look around for the creepy truck guy, he's staring at their car again. Then, in a move that seemed so full of bad intention that it actually freaked me out, he suddenly jumped in his truck, then went speeding off in the same direction as the girls did. I'm like, no. If that happened to me and my friend, I'd want someone to have our back too, even if it was just to trail us while dialing 911 or whatever. By the time I caught up with them, the guy was riding their butt with his high beams on, flashing his lights every so often like he was trying to get them to pull over or something. Then right there in front of me, the guy speeds up around the side of the girl's car. Then I can see him leaning over in his seat so he can 
shout stuff over to them. The next thing I know, the girl's car starts to pull over and I'm thinking, oh god, no, don't do it. But the guy in the truck just passes them and keeps going, maybe because he saw me in his rear view and knew that he couldn't do anything with witnesses. Then me and my friend also pull over right up behind where the girls are parked, and after putting my hazard lights on, we got out to see if they were okay. And they were not okay. The guy was so obviously not a cop, but apparently he'd been yelling at the girls that he was a deputy and that if they didn't pull over, they'd be going to jail. That was when they decided to actually do as he was asking, and if they pulled over without us being behind them, there's no telling what would have happened that night. I think it says everything that the guy just fled once we realized that they weren't alone. He must have known that his little cop impersonation wouldn't have stood up to scrutiny, but then he obviously wasn't planning on keeping his little charade up if he actually got the girls to pull over. If he'd have gotten his hands on them, they would have been in a whole world of hurt. We told the girls that they were welcome to stick behind us until we reached the next gas station or any place they could stop and link up with the cops to tell them what happened. They took us up on the offer and we parted ways not long after, but not after some very grateful hugs. Stuff like that made me wonder just how safe me and my friend were. Someone else had gotten unlucky that time, but how long would it be until it was us that had attracted the attention of some highway psycho? We tried to cut down on the amount of time we spent driving at night after that. It always made it much easier to get around, what with the roads being less busy, but I think we can all agree that there's something about the darkness that makes creeps feel more comfortable being creeps. There's a wilder point in there too, and it's something that'll always scare me as a young woman. We can take all the safety precautions we want, go on as many take-back-the-night marches as we can organize. Heck, we can go ahead and carry a gun if we're so inclined, but we'll never be able to stop people wanting to hurt other people. Some are born that way, some are made that way, and sometimes, when they really want to inflict pain or misery, there's really nothing anyone can do about it. I used to go to Arizona State, so whenever I could, I'd drive back to San Diego to see family and friends. It was a solid five and a half hour drive, but sometimes I'd get so homesick that I drove home on a Friday and be back home late on the Sunday. The point is, I used to spend a lot of time driving at night. So, this one week, my mom calls me with some pretty bad news. My grandpa was sick, like really sick, and had to be rushed to the hospital for treatment so she wanted to know if I could visit him with the implication being that it might be my very last chance to see him. The call came at like 11.30 at night, so I quickly packed my bags, told my roommate where I was going and how long I'd be, then started the night drive back to California. A few hours later, I'm driving through dry, dusty, rural Nevada when I decide to take one of my usual stops that I take when driving that route. For clarity's sake, it was just an hour or so before the California border, and I'm still very familiar with that particular stop because I used to perform the same little ritual every time I was getting ready to enter California. Since I was often driving alone a lot in Arizona, I used to conceal carry, and at the time, I had my extended permit which allowed concealed through several states, except of course, California. So, I park my car and I start disassembling and putting away my gun to be in compliance with Cali gun laws. When I'm done doing that, I step out to go to the restroom and grab some coffee before I go out on the road again. What I didn't know was that someone had managed to get close to my truck and was hiding along the passenger side. When I walk past them, whoever it was grabbed me from behind and I let out the loudest, most blood-curdling scream I could possibly muster. Kind of to alert anyone nearby, but mainly because I realized there was basically no one else around to see what was going on. I did all I could. I fought and tried to buck the guy off of me, but I wasn't doing very well. I tried kicking back at him, but he countered by lifting me off the ground where I couldn't get him. And then I tried to break through the grip his arms had on me, but that just made him bend me over with him still behind me. I'm not sure how long I was screaming and fighting, but when I heard tires screech, 
my fear ramped up like a thousand times. I figured the guy had a partner, that it was about to be tossed into the back of a truck or something, and I'd never be seen again. In reality, it was a Toyota Corolla full of local teenagers. God knows why they were at that gas station so late, but I thank God that they were, because I think they literally saved my life that night. The teens jumped out and ran towards us, and the guy who grabbed me took off. Two of the kids chased him through the desert beyond the gas station on foot, and the driver and the other kid made sure I was alright. They waited with me until the cops arrived and I could tell them what happened, even brought me a cup of coffee and let me bum a smoke. I didn't even smoke, I just felt like I needed one to calm myself down. For years afterwards, I used to send each of these guys thank you texts on the anniversary of my near miss, and if I hadn't lost the phone their numbers were saved on, I'd still do it. Because as much as those kids decided to be heroes that night, there are just as many people in the world who would have turned a blind eye and pretended they didn't see it. And I thank God that it wasn't one of those kinds of people who just so happened to pull into the parking lot when I needed them most. I was once driving down these narrow dirt roads in the middle of nowhere, and it was pouring rain in the dead of night. The rain in the roads were so bad that I was slowing down to 15 miles an hour sometimes and couldn't see any of the signs, and this was before GPS. At one point, I had to pull over to the side of the road to try and see the sign to see if I was going in the right direction. I didn't get out due to the rain, so I was craning my neck forward to try and make out where I was when suddenly the passenger door opened and a complete stranger started trying to climb into my car. Here in Honduras, there is a fair amount of violent crimes and hijackings, so I instinctively started panicking and yelling and screaming at the top of my lungs, putting my foot down on the gas and speeding away before the guy had a chance to really get in. First chance I could, I quickly leaned over and closed the passenger door, then carried on off down the road. I was breathing so heavily and my heart beating out of my chest at this point and trying my best to calm down, nearly in tears. I kept seeing it in my head the whole rest of the drive. It was definitely the scariest thing that's ever happened to me here and I try my best not to drive at night anymore. Next time, I might not be so lucky. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. Leah Roberts was born on July 23rd of 1976 in Durham, North Carolina. She grew up with her parents and two older siblings, Heather and Kara, who later described her as a sociable, laid-back young woman with a love of soccer and live music. Yet as Leah progressed into her teenage years, her family was hit by a series of sudden and unexpected tragedies. When she was just 17, Leah's father was diagnosed with a long-term respiratory illness, and three years later, her mother suddenly passed away as the result of an undiagnosed heart condition. After briefly taking some time off of school to cope, Leah was nearly killed during a serious traffic accident in the fall of 1998. She suffered a punctured lung and shattered femur, meaning doctors needed to insert a metal rod into her leg to aid the healing process. Just a few months later, in the spring of 1999, Leah temporarily withdrew from school again in order to spend more time with her dying father, who would go on to pass away a few weeks later in early April. In some ways, the barrage of tragedy had positive effects on Leah, who became intensely interested in philosophy, spirituality, and artistic expression as a way of coping. But unsurprisingly, there were many negative effects too. Leah struggled to catch up with her schoolwork and dropped out of college in the early 2000s, just months before she was due to graduate with a degree in Spanish and anthropology. Shortly afterward, Leah pursued a fresh start in the neighboring city of Raleigh, and by her 23rd birthday, she was living in a small apartment with her best friend, Nicole. She often spent time in local coffee shops and was said to be fostering a passion for writing, but without a doubt, Leah's true passion was for travel. After two separate backpacking trips around Europe and Central America, Leah developed a serious case of wanderlust, satisfying it through regular road trips with friends. 
It's not difficult to see that the thrill of discovery was very therapeutic for Leah. She was escaping the old in search of the new. March 9th of the year 2000 was a day that started out like any other for Leah and Nicole, and they made plans to babysit together the following day. Leah didn't seem distressed or worried about anything, and evidently felt comfortable enough to make plans for the near future. But then for some reason, at around 6pm that evening, Leah packed a suitcase, withdrew $3,000 from an ATM, then embarked on what appeared to be a 3,000 mile road trip across the United States. Nicole was surprised at Leah's abrupt departure. It wasn't unusual for her roommate to head off on extended road trips, but to leave so suddenly was definitely out of character. After failing to make contact with her for three days, Nicole contacted Leah's sister, Kara, to ask if she knew where she was. A concerned Kara then joined Nicole in searching Leah's bedroom for any clue to where she'd gone, and it was then that they found an envelope containing cash and a handwritten note. Dated March 9th, the note read, Dear Nicole, this is to cover bills for her while I'm gone. Remember, everyone is together in thoughts and prayers and time passes quickly. Have faith in me, yourself. Help Shep with Easter at Lotta House for fun for the children. Give Peter my laptop. Give everyone my love. See you soon. Tell Kara don't worry, even though she will. Cookies in the freezer. Love, Leah. Underneath the main body of text was a few scribble addendums, some of which read, I'm not going to take my own life. I'm the opposite. Remember Jack Kerouac? I'm on the road. This was a reference to one of Leah's favorite authors, Jack Kerouac, who'd authored a book named On the Road, which detailed his road trips across the United States. The reference further convinced Leah's loved ones that she simply departed on an impromptu road trip, an opinion shared by a friend named Janine Quiller. Janine had met Leah on a visit to her favorite coffee shop, and the pair had bonded over their love of Jack Kerouac's writing. Recalling the last conversation that they had, Janine didn't remember Leah acting unusual, but she did note that Leah had mentioned a desire to visit Desolation Peak in rural Whatcom County, Washington, a place mentioned in Jack Kerouac's autobiography, Dharma Bums. Kara gave the search a head start by revealing that she had power of attorney over her sister, a precaution she'd taken while Leah was backpacking around Costa Rica. This meant she could access Leah's bank records, then use any ATM transactions to paint a picture of her movements. It seemed that Leah was working her way west, and after starting in Raleigh, North Carolina, she made her way to California before her route turned north into Oregon and Washington. It seemed Leah did indeed have Desolation Park in mind, and having already mentioned this to Janine Quiller, the cohesive thinking Leah displayed encouraged those who were concerned for her. Yet Nicole and Kara still found Leah's sudden departure to be deeply worrying and were still desperate to see her safe return. Nine days after Leah went missing, during the early afternoon of March 19th, a man named Lionel Packett and his girlfriend were jogging through the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest in Whatcom County. At some point in their run, Lionel noticed an article of clothing hanging from a tree, and on further inspection, he discovered a white vehicle at the bottom of a roadside embankment. The 1993 Jeep Cherokee was heavily damaged and was surrounded by a haphazard collection of clothing and other personal belongings. Several blankets were draped over the windows as if someone had been camping inside the car, but it was abandoned at the time of Lionel's arrival. Based on the amount of damage, law enforcement believed that the Jeep had been moving at about 30 to 40 miles per hour when it crashed into the embankment and flipped over several times. Anyone inside would have been seriously injured or killed, yet there was no evidence that anyone had been inside at the time of the crash. There were no traces of hair or blood, the seatbelt was not strained, and no sign that anyone had struck their head against the wheel or windshield. All details which gave hope to those who wished to see Leah's safe return. Following the discovery of Leah's Jeep, two full search and rescue teams combed the surrounding area using dogs and a helicopter, but were unable to find a single trace of their missing person. A search of the Jeep revealed $2,500 tucked in a pair of Leah's jeans, along with various empty food containers and plastic bottles. 
yet the search turned up two items which Leah's loved ones found very concerning. The first was an ornate wooden box containing a ticket for a showing of the movie American Beauty. Such a simple item having such a decorative container indicates that the ticket was of significant sentimental value to Leah. But why would she bring it with her on her cross-country road trip? The second item of concern in Leah's Jeep was her mother's wedding ring. Nicole described the ring as being nothing short of sacred to Leah, and again, it's not clear why she had chosen to bring it along, but its presence in her Jeep was something that investigators found deeply disconcerting. Given that Leah's vehicle was so close to the road, it was highly unlikely that she'd wandered off into the woods, and investigators suspected that she'd managed to hitchhike in pursuit of assistance. This theory was backed up by the fact that there were several reported sightings of Leah throughout the state of Washington in the days following her disappearance. One man claimed to have seen a young woman matching Leah's description at a Texaco gas station in Everett, about 70 miles south of where her jeep was abandoned. The man claimed Leah was visibly disoriented and that she had no idea who she was or where she lived. The man offered Leah help, but she refused it, then disappeared from view. On March 21st, Nicole and Kara traveled up to Washington State to look for their sister. They were unsuccessful in finding her, but managed to raise enough awareness of Leah's disappearance that a man ended up reaching out to Nicole and Kara in relation to their search. The man claimed to have spotted Leah at a restaurant and described her as being friendly and talkative before leaving the restaurant with a man calling himself Barry. The restaurant in question is located less than an hour's drive from where Leah's abandoned jeep was found, meaning that she was probably in the company of this mysterious man when she ran into trouble. The man's description of Barry was so detailed that law enforcement arranged for him to meet with a sketch artist, and a composite drawing of the suspect was subsequently created. Yet frustratingly, the police were never able to verify that Barry actually existed. After searching Leah's car, detectives asked her sister what she wanted them to do with the vehicle. Kara told them to keep it, hoping that technological advances might someday glean more evidence from it. The decision paid off back in 2006 when two detectives reviewing the case realized that the Jeep had not been searched as thoroughly as they previously thought. Although the interior had been processed for blood, hair, and fibers, no one had thought to explore underneath the hood of the car for any evidence. When they opened up the hood, they found that someone had messed with the engine so that a person could turn on the ignition, push a switch, and cause the Jeep to accelerate into the embankment on its own without anyone actually being present inside the vehicle. On top of that, the police also found a set of unidentified fingerprints under the hood of the car, fingerprints that could well have belonged to the man calling himself Barry. Barry was discovered to have previously served as a mechanic in the U.S. military, and it's reasonable to assume that he was capable of engine tampering. Yet after tracking the man down and securing a copy of his fingerprints, investigators were amazed to find that they didn't match those on the Jeep. Barry has since claimed to be completely innocent of any wrongdoing, and merely bumped into Leah at the restaurant. He mentioned her talking a lot about Jack Kerouac, but otherwise seemed in perfectly high spirits as she climbed into her Jeep and drove out of the parking lot. Barry insisted that this was the final time he saw Leah, and was devastated to hear that such a charming young woman had disappeared. But given that he was one of the last people Leah interacted with before her disappearance, Barry has never been completely eliminated as a potential suspect. Yeah, there's one school of thought which purports a very curious theory indeed, one which revolves around the idea that Leah had tried to fake her own death. The nature of the tampering which occurred on Leah's engine leads us to believe that someone wanted to move Leah's Jeep without actually being inside of it. Then, since the Jeep was sent crashing down a steep embankment, it's safe to say that whoever was responsible wanted people to believe that there was a driver inside at the time of the crash. This means that Leah hired someone capable of rigging her car's engine and that Barry might well be involved in a secretive underground group who offered to help a person to disappear in exchange for cash. This would explain why Leah had made so many ATM stops on her way to Washington, but again, it's never been something investigators have been able to confirm. The fact remains that more than 20 years after she disappeared, 
we're still no closer to learning the truth behind Leah's disappearance. Perversely, the best case scenario is that she faked her own death and for some reason found it in herself to deceive and terrify those closest to her in order to do so. But then the worst case scenario is that Leah's trip to Washington really had been as innocent as it was spontaneous and that just outside of a small mountain town, she'd been snatched up, murdered, and then entombed somewhere that no one might ever find. Perhaps there's someone in rural Washington still going about their daily lives, who still carries a little piece of Leah wherever they go, as a reminder that they've gotten away with murder. On May 18th of 1935, George and Laura Lorius joined their friends Albert and Tilly Haberer on the cross-country road trip of a lifetime. From their home in southern Illinois, the group planned on driving across 2,000 miles of plains and desert before finally finishing up on the coast of California, and by May 21st, they had arrived in the small town of Vaughn, New Mexico. After piling out of George Lorius's Nash sedan, the two couples checked into the Vaughn Hotel before sending off several postcards to friends and family. Then, after a small dinner at a local diner, the group retired to their rooms for the night before continuing west the following morning. In their postcards, the group seemed to be in high spirits and reported nothing untoward occurring during their most recent drive. But after the couples continued driving west on the morning of the 22nd, neither was ever heard from again. It wasn't until the morning of May 26 that the Lorius's car was found abandoned in the business district of Dallas, Texas. The vehicle's keys were still in the ignition, the gas tank was full, and numerous postcards lay in the passenger seat. But there was no sign of any of the Illinois road trippers. Gas station receipts confirmed that Mr. Lorius had purchased fuel in a place called Socorro on May 23rd, but after that, their fate was anyone's guess. The following week, the couple's families were notified of their disappearance, and an official investigation was launched. Police initially believed that the absence of $400 worth of traveler's checks indicated that a violent robbery had taken place. However, investigators soon discovered that the couple's car had been involved in a minor accident shortly after arriving in Socorro. Since the accident could have angered someone enough to do harm to the road trippers, police began questioning the handful of witnesses to the crash. Yet instead of describing the vehicle as containing two middle-aged couples, witnesses stated that the lone occupant was a young man with dark-colored hair. Detectives managed to track the vehicle from the scene of the accident to a small local repair shop. Mechanics changed a tire on the vehicle and completed other minor repairs, then whoever was driving the car paid with one of George Lorius's traveler's checks. Detectives then followed the trail of cash checks to a motel in El Paso, and then to Dallas, which is where the vehicle was found abandoned on May 26th. The investigation briefly stalled until June 29th, when a report came in of a small desert bushfire on the outskirts of Albuquerque. The fire department arrived to discover a piece of burning luggage. Inside were the smoldering belongings of George and Laura Lorius. With the man responsible for the couple's disappearance still actively disposing of their belongings, law enforcement rushed into action in the hopes they might still be recovered alive. The FBI headed up a multi-agency task force which searched rivers, lakes, mine shafts, wells, and numerous spots around the desert. Yet despite the vast reach of the well-staffed search teams, not a trace of the missing couples could be found. Unable to apprehend a suspect, detectives found themselves diverted to other investigations, and the case eventually went cold. But as recently as 2010, the case files are still revisited by various state police officers, each hoping for a flash of inspiration. According to one such officer, Agent Norman Rhodes, the case has never been officially closed, but the low probability of it being solved means that the New Mexico State Police can rarely afford to pay it any mind. Yet despite the perceived difficulties of the case, Agent Rhodes has since made it his personal mission to discover what happened to the four Illinois road trippers. 
Rhodes stated that perhaps his most daunting task has been trying to locate the remains of the road trippers' bodies, which are most likely nothing more than desiccated bones today. It will also be no small feat to locate the couple's killer, who will have probably died of old age since the crime took place, but such a prospect hasn't seemed to have deterred Agent Rhodes. Perhaps his zeal comes from the ongoing support and assistance provided by Laura Lorius's great-niece, Barbara Ashcraft, who is desperate to see the family mystery finally solved. When pressed on what her theories regarding his relative's fate, Ashcraft believes they were murdered in Vaughn, possibly in the very same cafe that they had their breakfast in on the morning of their disappearance. The purpose of their stop in Vaughn was so that the Lorius's could visit an old friend who just so happened to live there, but it's unclear whether or not this friend actually met with them. Not only that, but in 1963, a private investigator named Walter Duke received a letter from a woman claiming to have witnessed the murders. The woman said she watched the two couples being escorted into the basement of a cafe, and that she had later heard that they'd been robbed, murdered, and then buried in wet concrete. The tip has led Barbara Ashcraft to suggest that the investigation should focus on the concrete slabs lining the site of the former Vaughn Hotel, but Agent Norman Rhodes has another theory. After combing over stacks of reports in the State Police Records Division, Rhodes has created a timeline of events and interviews that's an incredible 141 pages long. According to him, two postcards in particular have convinced Rhodes that the couples actually left Vaughn on the morning of May 22nd with the intention of driving to Albuquerque via Santa Fe. A postcard marked May 22nd was mailed to Albuquerque and a clerk at Albuquerque's Sturgis Hotel told investigators that the couples visited her hotel that afternoon to ask about renting rooms. Agent Rhodes believed that the couples rented one of the smaller rooms at this hotel so that each of them could take a shower and intended to travel over to Gallup by nightfall. Yet shortly after leaving town, they suffered their run-in with their mysterious killer. It's very possible that the couples misjudged the distance to Albuquerque and had ended up driving around in the dark when it's much harder to properly navigate. Rhodes believed that this is how they became vulnerable to a potential predator, and that the couple simply misplaced their trust in someone who brutally and violently betrayed them. Although spotted by a handful of witnesses, the police are no closer to identifying the man who took George Lorius' car as they were almost 90 years ago. But even if this person was identified, they're probably in no fit state to answer questions about something that occurred back in 1935, and it's unlikely that there's any surviving forensic evidence. The truth behind the disappearance of George Lorius, Laura Lorius, and their friends Albert and Tilly might well have vanished along with them, and the mystery of how four regular, wholesome people simply disappeared one day is unlikely to ever be unraveled. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official. And maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, you better call Saul.